All right, peace, ETM Hotep. Welcome in peace. This is your brother Wujao bin Ib Eddie Ma'at, and welcome to the Seshu Ma'ani Meadow Nature YouTube channel, the home of the Seshu Ma'ani Meadow Nature. All right. Um, also, the home of Freestyle Fridays, the home of Divine Words Wednesdays, the home of uh, what else? We don't. The home of um, proper methodology and good character. Proper methodology, good character. There you go. <laughs> so uh yeah won't you all introduce yourselves uh before we jump straight in etm hotel welcome in peace everybody it's your brother june just want to say thanks for tuning in i hope you like the show please give the channel and the show um help by giving it a thumbs up we appreciate that uh subscribe if you haven't and uh we always read the comments um, thanks for tuning in. I go, hope you guys leave with satisfaction. Hotep. Hotep, Ren E. Imigit, and welcome. Okay, that was short. All right. I forgot, Brother Kofi's not here. Uh, we'd had a long uh, 20, 20 minute introduction. No, let me just. But anyway, so peace to everyone. Appreciate all 11,000 of you all who tuned in uh, right away. You all have obviously subscribed or received notification or saw the link that's being passed around. But tonight's discussion is going to be a um, brief lesson on the importance of nomenclature in terms of conflict resolution. All right. We have a tendency to see a lot of conflict um, out here on social media. So tonight we're going to go in a little bit on the importance of nomenclature. All right. Uh, for those of you who are, who are new to our channel, make sure you check out the archives. We've been um, doing Freestyle Fridays for quite some time, and we started it back up. We've been doing Divine Words Wednesdays um, as well, and we're going to get back into doing that as well. All right. Freestyle Friday is where we transliterate and translate simple Egyptian inscriptions, um, either email to us um, put into our Facebook group or what have you. And we do it in a freestyle fashion where we don't use any books, no sign lists or glyph lists, no dictionaries, nothing straight from the dome. All right. And so we have fun with it and it's a, it's basically a fun way to test your skills and, you know, your ability to use the tools and resources that you learn in the process of actually learning about the language. All right. So, um, any I have any any anything to open with? Um, any comments or concerns before we start? Nope, I'm good. All right, everybody's good. All right, all right. So, trying to buy a little bit of time for for a few more to tune in because um, I think this is important. It's an important um, topic. Is not rocket science. And it's not a um, very long thing to even discuss, but it's something that's very important and it's overlooked. So this is what we're going to talk about, the importance of nomenclature. And um, so if you all have any questions afterwards, it depends on how how this um, unfolds. But, you know, we we are always in the habit of posting a link to invite people on the panel to have a discussion and our last three shows were very long and we did a three-part series basically giving some commentary about the conflict that we're seeing in the social community uh, being called the conscious community all right so we spent I think three hours each <laughs> each night for three nights uh, giving some commentary slowing the conversation down and uh, it was our attempt to be surgical at addressing, first identifying the issues and then addressing them a little bit and then offering solutions. OK, so if you go in the archive, those are our last three videos. And we invited everyone to come on the panel and we address people in the chat. So tonight's going to be a little different. We just want to briefly talk about the importance of nomenclature. But depending on how it goes, we may open up the panel if anyone has questions or um or any comments that they want to make 
All right. So if you all don't have anything, then I'm going to go ahead and get started. So last call for um, for anybody, any any of you on the panel about anything. Nope. Uh, all right. Well, we got a couple seconds. I usually say it um, in my intro and I forgot, but we have, have a bunch of links and resources in our description box. So check that out. And also that uh, super chat is available and we really appreciate all those people that donated um, so far. All right, all right. <laughs> and I already thought that was a long intro. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, um, ho hopefully I'm clear enough for that. Enough. Yeah. Or am I still up? Oh, no, we can hear you. Okay. Uh, now I just wanted to say um, in regards to, you know, um, the three sessions that we had. I think actually um, I did um, see you post, um, you know, you had a good post uh, the other day in regards to um, trying to figure out where some of the claims are coming from. And I think um, that was good because um, there's a lot that, you know, hopefully, you know, those three sessions kind of like, uh, you know, uh, made people realize you know, the, the need to just be surgical and, um, and actually, you know, uh, not uh, taking things out of proportion because that post that you did actually was one of the issues that I had as well. Was like, you know, when you hear people make a certain claim and they don't put a name to it, and then, and then you, you know, that claim kind of like grows legs, and it becomes this huge thing that everybody's discussing, and then come to find out it's not really that much of a huge. Um, deal or even if it's a huge deal you know it could it could be tackled differently as opposed to weeks on ends of live sessions and all that stuff while somebody could just do like what you did uh, with um, some of the claims where you made the videos with the kinetic, uh yoga and the chakra stuff so I think that was interesting but hopefully people kind of learn you know and we don't see the same but I don't know if, you know <laughs> well we'll we'll find out you know we didn't get here overnight and we certainly won't solve the issues overnight either. So hopefully we're, you know, slowing down the train to a complete stop and we'll be able to push it in the opposite direction. So I want to go ahead and jump in. So again, um, ETM Hotep, for those of you who have joined us late, this is your brother Wujau. I also have uh, Sonnet Emiket and Sun Jun with me, um, a part of the Seshu Mani Meta Nature. And tonight we're going to briefly talk about the importance of nomenclature and so I'm just gonna begin so this is a quick lesson on the importance of nomenclature and also a quick review of an older video we did entitled what is a word okay and we can't talk about nomenclature until you know we have to understand uh, a word so I'm gonna do a quick review of that as well so kind of mix it in together all right, so let me get my cursor all set. Okay, so now when talking about um, these things, we have to first identify a problem. You know, I always say to solve a, solve a problem, you have to identify a problem or come up with a solution. You have to identify the problem accurately. So one of the main issues that we have really all over the world for multiple, multiple different topics um, from, you know, nations against nations, global conflicts to conflicts in personal relationships between husband and wife, uh, siblings, business partners, et cetera, et cetera, is um, the source of most of those conflicts is a result of miscommunication between two or more parties. All right. That is at the heart of most miscommunication, excuse me, most conflicts around the world, great or small. And so, but it happens when what's communicated lacks enough information, all right? When you're trying to convey your thoughts to another person, the way you communicate can lack, 
key information that will cause a misunderstanding or misinterpretation or mischaracterization of what it is you're trying to convey. And then if that spirals out of control, depending on the topic, depending on the issue, then it can blossom into a conflict. All right. And so that's the core or the root cause of most conflicts all around the world. Miscommunication. All right. Remember that. So because homo sapiens sapiens, we're all homo sapiens sapiens and or human and we're not telepathic, we have to use language in order to communicate. And so what's the what's the purpose of language is so that we can have a meeting of the mind. That's the aim and goal of communication. All right. Because we, we're not telepathic. All right. And so we communicate with one another to place each other in each other's mind. So we have language for that. All right. And there's thousands of languages on the planet. All right. But essentially, what is a language? All right. So I'm just going to be give, you know, sum up these things because I can we can talk about these for hours, really, each one of these uh, key points. But I'm just going to um, say enough things that hopefully you all will follow along. So when we say language. Or when I say or anyone says I speak so and so language, I speak English, I speak Spanish, I speak French. What what is it that we're talking about? What are we talking about? And so we understand that language consists of words. And but what are words? You know, we, we think we know what words are because we use them from the moment we start learning how to talk at a very, very, very young age. Um, but what are words? All right. We know languages are composed of words, but what are words? So here on the screen, you'll see a split between two sides. On the left hand side, you see form and the right hand side, you see meaning. And so the form consists of either a sound pattern, if it's being spoken or heard, spoken by the um, speaker or heard by the listener or written form, form, all right, characters on some medium, paper or whatever, what have you. All right. So that will be form, whether it's sound or written characters. So you're either hearing with your ears or you're seeing with your eyes. All right. On the other side. You have meaning, which is the mental conceptualization um, that takes place within the mind. All right. So this is the concept. So we have form and meaning. So each word in languages have two sides to it, almost like a coin. So here you see a coin here. All right. Two coins. On one side, you have form. On the other side, you have meaning. And so, again, on the form side, we have sound pattern or the written pattern. This is called the signifier. On the other side, we have the meaning. Which is the concept or the conceptualization within the mind. And this is called the signified. All right. And so what words are essentially are called are signs. We call them signs and signs are. The two sides of the coin and then the link. The link that um, or the chain that links these two together. So if I were to illustrate it a little differently, look at this triangle here. So every sign or what we would like to call a word is a link between form and meaning. That's what a sign is. So essentially a sign is a triune a composition of three things, form, meaning, and the link in be between the two. All right. Always remember that. So let's illustrate this uh, a little bit further. So we're going to use the language of English. All right. So here on the form side, we have the word spelled out. E-L-E-P-H-A-N-T. And then we have the sound pattern. OK, elephant. This is how we pronounce it. So whether we say it as elephant or we write it 
as um, as it's spelled out there. We will conjure up a concept in our mind of a large gray animal with big ears. It weighs tons and has a long snout and some ivory tusks. OK, so this is the concept side or meaning side. So, again, we have form and we have meaning. And then a complete sign is the link between the two. So this specifically is an English sign. All right. So what does this mean? This means when we again, when we say we speak a language. So if I say I speak English, what I'm saying is that I am a part of a community of speakers. Or communicators that share the same set of signs in our mind in our mental dictionary or mental lexicon all right and so i can only s communicate with those who share the same signs as me and the collection of all of these signs is what composes a language all right and then there's a gradient there's gradient um uh, you know, there's gradients of of distances between what's a language versus what's a dialect versus what makes a completely distinct language. One language from another versus dialects of the same language. These are very um, thin gradients with that, and it has to deal with um, intelligibility. All right. But that's a whole nother topic that I'm not going to discuss for now. So that's an English example of a sign and all English speakers will be able to I'll be, be able to communicate with me um, using utilizing this sign. All right. Now, we we tend to only think about the form. We say elephant. Even though you're conceptualizing, you know, this animal here. But when we discuss and talk about these things, we we you know, unless you're a linguist that actually studies this, we're only going to really think about um, the form as the word. But that's incomplete. The, the sign com is composed of these three different elements, the form, meaning and a link between the two. That link is very important. All right. Um, if we break the link, we can do something else with it. But that's again, that's probably for another another discussion. Here's another example. Here's a uh, Kiswahili sign. The same concept on the concept side. We have a large gray animal, big ears, weighs tons, snout. Same thing. But the form is different. The form is pronounced ndovo. All right. So that means that all Swahili speakers or people who speak the Swahili language would be I would be able to communicate with them. This is a Swahili sign. All right. Although it shares the same concept as the English sign, it's a completely different sign. And I want you to keep up with me on that. All right. Next, here's a Dulo, Dulo sign. All right, these are um, speakers who speak uh, Duluo or Luo. Same concept, same animal, same concept in the mind, but the sound pattern is Liech. All right, so this is how um, a community of Duluo speakers would uh, communicate to each other for the same concept, Liech. Spanish. Here's a Spanish sign. Same animal, same concept, but the sound pattern would be elefante. Elefante. That's how Spanish speakers would communicate with each other. And then lastly, last example for Rani Kemet. And Rani Kemet is the ancient Egyptian language. In ancient Egypt, for the same concept, the exact same concept, same animal, they would um, write it this way. And our today's conventional pronunciation of this word would be Abu. So ancient Egyptians would communicate with each other for this concept and say Abu to each other. All right. Again, our modern pronunciations are are just modern conventions. But this is how it is spelled within the session of natural or the hieroglyphs. All right. So the important thing here that I'm demonstrating is that what we think is as a word is really a sign consisting of three important elements, the form, the meaning, 
and then the link between the two. All right. So now what does that lead us to? Now notice that I have four examples. I had the English, Swahili, Duluo, Spanish, and Rodney Kemet. Five. Five examples for the same concept, but the form changed. So what did we just do? What what did we just witness? Well, what we um, just did would be considered translations or um, to translate. And so what is translation? Translation, in a nutshell, is the communication of meaning. So it's a, it's a semantic endeavor. So it's a communication of meaning of a source language text by means of an equivalent target language text. All right. And so in order to translate anything from language to language, you have to have knowledge of both languages, the, the source and the target. All right. And the reason why, when we say knowledge of a language, you have to have these signs in your mind. You have to have the Rani Kemet sign. Uh, and let's say the English sign in your mind to be able to translate. So in English, we say elephant. And in Rodney Kemet, we would say Abu for the same thing. And you can translate elephant to Abu or Abu to the English word elephant. That's what translations are. All right. So I, w I just wanted to give you all a brief review of what's a word. Now, we did a full video um, on this and it's in our archives so you all can check it out. But I wanted to do that first to prep you in understanding that it's more to a word than, you know, meets the eye that we take for granted in our day to day conversations and day to day um, duties. All right. So now that's leading us up to the importance of nomenclature. All right. So first, let's start off with what nomenclature is. The word nomenclature is defined as the devising or choosing of names for things, especially in a science or other discipline. And I want y'all to, to make sure you all stay with me on that. A science or discipline. The body or system of names in a particular field. The nomenclature of chemical compounds. The term or terms applied to something, excuse me, or someone or something. All right, that's what nomenclature is. Every scientific or philosophic discipline has a need for a very concise set of terms for itself, a very precise labeling system. Failing to create a concise nomenclature results in ambiguity. The failure of most writers on spiritual matters. Uh, excuse me, the failure to failure of most writers on spiritual matters to take care of uh, this requirement is the chief reason for the confusion that reigns in the minds and in the, in their minds and in the minds of their readers. Confusion is brought about through imprecise language. Spirituality is a science. Therefore, to make it scientific, there is a need for a concise nomenclature. Just as there is a politically correct language, there is a need for a spiritually correct language. Now, I'm using spirit, spirituality and things uh, in the in the air quotes, because the point is, is that people attempt to speak about spirituality in a scientific way, but they're using amb ambiguous language to do so. And so the point here is that every single um, worthwhile discipline, every scientific discipline, every every um um you know study discipline that's out out there they create a nomenclature fitting for whatever that particular um pursuit is so astrophysicists they have a a set key terminology that they use um legal lawyers they have uh, legal jargon they have certain terms that they are very familiar with that only applies within the realm of legalese and and the courtroom and things uh, chemistry the same way linguistics the same way genetics the same thing so if we're going to if we're going to talk about quote unquote religious things or quote unquote spiritual things then there's going to be a need to have a 
quote unquote religious nomenclature or a spiritual nomenclature or spiritually correct language, as I'm saying. All right. So that's the importance of it. And that's not what we're seeing. We're not seeing that um, in these conversations that we see online. All right. Everyone's talking all over the place. Everyone is using words that are very um, polarized and very ambiguous. The word spirit, the word um, spirituality, the word spiritual, the word belief, the word religion, the word God, the word soul, um, worship. All these different words are being tossed around and used without, um, you know, a very precise way of using them. All right. There's no precise labeling system for the different things that people are making attempts to talk about. So this is why it's very, very important to create a nomenclature. And that's what's absent. All right. So another thing along with nomenclature or what should be a goal in in creating one is what's called objective language. We want to be a, as objective as possible. And this is where science or your knowledge of science and math will definitely come in handy because if you are um, used to science and math and those are maybe subjects that you grown to love or whatever, you'll be familiar of, of, uh, with the importance of objective language. So here's an example. If if I were to ask you anyone, what is the temperature outside? And so we see on the subjective side. We have two people, person A and person B <clears throat> on the subjective side. Person A will may say, well, it's hot outside. And person B will say um, it's cold outside. And, I, and I'm asking both of them at the same time. And so now I have two different answers. Person A. Just gives me hot outside. Person B gives me cold outside. So now I'm stuck. I'm like, well, what is it? Is it is it hot or is it cold? And now I don't know what is cold to that person or what is hot to the other person i don't know so so i'm i'm still in limbo but if they were to answer me using um objective language they would answer differently person a will have to say it's 85 degrees outside and guess what person b will have to agree with it there's no room for ambiguity by giving the actual fahrenheit um temperature outside they're being objective and I will be better off um, with the answer and I'll be able to um, utilize uh, the answer for whatever reason I asked the question. So that's the difference between subjective language and objective language. Now, we can't be objective all the time. But the point here, the takeaway is that when we're discussing and we're pursuing knowledge and we're doing research and we're having discussions about um all these different things that, you know, we see online and on social media that we should, one, develop a precise nomenclature. And then two, we should be as objective as possible in the way that we communicate. And so this is just an example of that, the difference. All right. And this would fix a lot, a whole lot of the problem, a whole lot of the noise. And this is what it's about. It's about killing the noise in, in 2020. All right. So. Having said all of that, um, I'm just going to define a couple of terms um, that we're used to hearing in these quote unquote religious discussions, quote unquote spiritual discussions and things like that. All right. For, for the past few years that we've seen on social media. So I'm just going to define some of these words in hopes that you all will see um, the importance of creating a nomenclature. And this is going to be an example of doing that. OK, so we're going to start with the word praise. Because praise is. Um, is a, a word used praise, worship and all these other words. So we're going to define define them. All right. So praise. Um, despite and I'll just read these. They, this is coming from the um, etymology of these words. And it's important. Um, especially for key terms and when you're actually creating a nomenclature, a very precise and and as objective as possible as you can um, labeling system or language that you definitely understand the etymology of the words that you're using. 
All right. Now, we know language change over time, which means the meaning or the way it's used may change slightly over time. But knowing how it was coined and those slight changes over time, it will help you to have a fuller understanding. All right. So this is why we do this. So the word praise. Uh, despite a certain similarity in form and meaning, praise has no connection with pray. It ult excuse me, it comes ultimately from Latin pretium, which means price, which is also given English precious price prize, etc. From it was derived the late Latin verb uh, pretiere, which means value, value highly or praise, which English acquired via old French presier. And I'm, I'm sure I'm butchering the um, <laughs> French pronunciation. So we can see that praise has to do with um, value. OK, the value of something. And the value of something, when we go into a store, we call it a price. You know, what's the price on this? Like, oh, these shoes are nice. How much do they cost? What's the price? Um, a prize, a high prize. When you do something, you get you you win something of value, and we call it a prize. Uh, we also say something of value is precious, precious metal, precious stones. You know, these are these are metals and stones that are. Um, they have high value. OK, so that's what praise is. So when we use it in the quote unquote religious conversations and spiritual context and everything like that, people may have a different meaning for that word praise. But if we bring it back to what the word means or what the word developed, how it developed then we can have a very more precise uh, way of using it. All right. So that's praise. So remember, praise is simply um, something of high value. Now, if you praise someone, that's almost the same as giving an appraisal on a car before you sell it or a house before you buy it. You're putting a value to it. OK, valuation. Appraisal, praise price precious prize all right so remember that so when you praise someone that means you value them they are, they, they are very important to you all right let's keep going another word that comes up veneration you know the veneration of ancestors you know ancestral veneration that's a, this is a word that that comes up um often as well so this word comes from the latin word venus so Latin Venus meant love or charm. It came ultimately from the same Indo-European base as pronounced English wish and winsome and a Sanskrit uh, vacha wish. And I'm sure I'm butchering those pronunciations. It was not that common <clears throat> as a generic term. It's most familiar role being as the name of the Roman goddess of love. From it was derived venerus, venerius, which means of sexual love or sexual intercourse, which English borrowed and adapted as venereal. And this is where we get venereal disease um, from a disease that was contracted from sexual intercourse, uh, which that term dates from the mid 17th century. Other contributions made by Latin Venus to English include venerable and venerate. And therefore veneration. So what is the takeaway here? Veneration of ancestors is to love your ancestors. It is to. Um, you're showing love, you know, show love, show love. We're showing love when you venerate a person, you venerate a person who's alive or you venerate a person who was alive. You're showing love for them or to them. All right. So that's veneration. Notice nothing spooky, quote unquote, spooky about praising, nothing spooky about venerating. All right. Another word, devotion. All right. Devotion. We hear this a lot. So essentially the word devout and devote are the same word. They come from an identical source, but reached English along two different routes. 
That source is devotus, which is the past participle of Latin devovere, which was a compound form from the intensive prefix D and vovere, promise, which is a source of the English word vote and vow. So remember, vovere means promise. And when you get married, you take your marriage vows, which is a list of promises, supposed to be, <laughs> supposed to be a list of, of promises that you give to your spouse husband or your wife all right uh, volveri which is to vow uh, devote you're devoting yourself this entered english originally via old french uh, devo as an adjective and was then reborrowed directly from latin in the 16th century as the basis of a verb so this is related to vote or vow now remember when you cast your vote um casting a vote is that you're you're establishing a um, promise? That's what you're doing. You're 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 giving your your promise to um, a particular cause or even a person. All right. So that's what devotion is. All right. Now, devotion to anything is to is is pretty much to um, it's almost similar to obligating yourself. A promise is an obligation. You know, we can use those uh, synonymously. To obligate yourself to something, to devote yourself to something, or someone. All right, so we're gonna keep going. Nothing spooky. All right, nothing spooky. Next word, worship. Praise and worship is used in the in you know back to back. They like you know Bonnie and Clyde as as words. Praise and worship. Praise and worship. So worship. Worship began life as a compound noun meaning virtually worthiness. It was formed from the adjective worth and the noun suffix ship, which is a state or condition. And at first it was used for distinction, credit, dignity. This soon passed into respect and reverence, but it was not used in specifically religious context until the 13th century. The verb dates from the 12th century. OK, so what's the takeaway? Worship is um a word that means worth is to place worth or see worth in something this is why praise and worship are used very very closely in the same sentences by a lot of people praise and worship praise and worship praise and worship so something of high value has worth high value is praise something of worth is worthy of worship okay um worshipful a person who is worshipful is a person that has worth and has high value. All right. So you worship things that are what important to you. And it simply means that you you see the worth in something important and worth are used interchangeably or synonymously in the way that people talk about and use these things. OK, so to worship something. Is to give worth worth to it and then you know, uh, you, or you see worth in it. All right. Next one. Religion. This is like the, uh, what do you call it? Um, it's a bad word to some people. Religion. Religious. Religion. It's used as like a weapon. People use it as a weapon. So what is this word? This word is from the Latin word religio. Originally meant obligation or bond. All right. It was probably derived from the verb uh, religare, which is to tie back, or religare, to tie back, uh, or to tie tight, the source of the English word to rely. A compound form from the prefix re, which means back, and legare, which means to tie. The source of the English liable and ligament, and also ligature. All right. Um, remember, if you're liable to something, you're obligated to it. Or you're bound or bonded to it. A ligament in the body is is a is a piece of is a part of your body that um, joins or ties two or more moving parts or what have you. And then a ligature is a character that's that's um, binds uh, more than one character or strokes uh, together in terms of ligature and handwriting. All right. 
So you see the commonality of this is is something that is tied together, bounded. And that's where you, we get obligation from. It developed a specialized sense of bond between human beings and the gods. And from the fifth century, it came to be used for monastic life. Um, the sense in which English originally acquired it from old French religion. Okay, so in English, it it was already developed into um, the obligations that people um, went through in order to live a monas uh, a monastic life style, you know, of uh, monks and nuns, as they would say. All right, these are obligations or bonds that they ob obligated to themselves to all right and actually devote you can use the word devote they devoted themselves to these things all right uh religious practices emerged from this but the words standard modern meaning did not develop until as recently as the 16th century so the way we use it today in our common you know discussions wasn't really developed until the 16th century but the point here is that it has to do with obligation like a contract what do you what do you obligate yourself to all right that's what religion is that's what a religion is it is an obligation and everybody is obligated to something thus everybody has a religion so when we toss around this word religion in a pejorative way as a weapon what are we doing all right so again this is the importance of nomenclature when we have these discussions because these discussions have been going on for a long time where people toss these words around spirit spiritual spirituality soul spirit um religion worship god and so on and so forth all right so we need to change that and that's the importance of what i'm sh sharing uh, tonight and showing the importance of nomenclature um so I'm going to wrap it up by I want to show you all that over four years ago, it's like four years ago, um, I had did Facebook posts. And it probably goes back before then because I, I, sometimes I repeat my post um, every now and then. But here are two Facebook posts where I spoke to the importance of nomenclature. This is from 2016. One is from November and the other one's from April. All right. And so I'm just going to read this as i um conclude and i know you all can't see that it's, it's probably small on the screen and you all can maybe y'all can read it okay on this first one uh, i'm just gonna read it i believe overall the conscious community and i always put that in quotes the conscious community needs to realize that spirituality requires a complex educational system providing spiritual or religious instruction and development is as complex and rigorous and even more so than teaching biology theoretical physics or chemistry anyone that's fully versed in these subjects knows that to successfully teach these subjects requires the following a curriculum that spans about 10 years lesson plans for every topic taught a nomenclature that is specific to the subject because you cannot use words and concepts uh, from their strict everyday communication. All right. Um, a clear picture of the topics and skills being taught. So we have to we have to show the parts and the whole. Clear standards for the completion of each topic, year and graduation, accredited instructors, objective evaluation of students, which means students can't grade themselves and teachers can cannot do so subjectively. All right. Or subjectively. So in a nutshell, these are the elements that go into turning out successful accountants, mathematicians, biologists, chemists, etc. The same should be applied to any so-called spiritual or religious system. All right. Remember this. All right. Because we can identify with accountants, doctors, lawyers, mathematicians, geneticists, biologists. But what system is pumping out? The, the equivalent in the quote unquote spiritual um, subject matters or the religious subject matters. 
All right. Now we know they have um, divinity school schools, and even in divinity schools, they will set up a curriculum and go through all of these things. But that's not what we see on the social community when people have these debates and these conversations. So the specialness of any language is possibly seen in the people's ability to create a nomenclature in that language to express knowledge with objectivity and with as little ambiguity as possible. We witness this today with all fields of study that have contributed to the body of knowledge that we call science. All right. And I put um, when we know better, we do better. And so I'm sharing this with you all and whoever watched this in the archive. And I hope, you know, you'll be motivated to do better when we know better. This is something that's absolutely necessary. All right. The other other post I'm going to share is the last thing is um, something about figurative speech that I was talking about four years ago. So I'll just read it. Um, something that needs to be fundamentally understood. Africans have an ancient history of making use of what we call today the various forms of figure figures of speech when documenting information. These forms include but not limited to allegory, metaphor, myth, etc. This is important because when misunderstood, this lack of understanding is partly responsible for the new forms of pseudoscience that people are arguing about. African quote unquote spirituality should be highly respected enough where the discussions are taken just as serious as one would on the topics of biogenetics, astrophysics, chemistry, quantum mechanics, etc. These scientific disciplines are highly technical, specialized, and make use of a specialized nomenclature that eliminates ambiguity and seeks to eliminate error. People who engage in such discussions make sure that they are proficient and competent enough to do so. This doesn't happen when it comes to African quote unquote spirituality. We have many people who are not proficient and incompetent on these issues, but still speak on them and even argue and debate. For example, excuse me, few examples of the lack of understanding the various forms of figure of speech and running with that misunderstanding which gives birth to what's being called pseudoism. So here's some examples. Snakes and serpents don't talk. Men don't live in large fish for three days and three nights. Bushfires don't talk. Serpents don't become walking sticks. Dead people don't recite anything. Dead people don't walk. From Africa to the Middle East, many of these forms of documented figure of speech are being misinterpreted and misunderstood and regurgitated, giving birth to pseudoism. It's a product of microwave research and the overall lack of discipline and dedication to, to learning proper methodology and discernment. OK, so again, I've been fussing about this since uh, 2016 and, and probably longer. All right. So uh, I just, I'm going to conclude with that. That's my last um, thing to share. But I just want to show you all that this is very important. It should be taken important. I take it serious, and I've been, I've been uh, screaming this to to the you know blue in the face now. Um, but this is why things have to change. Things are going to have to change if we're ever ever going to make headway with any of these conversations. Otherwise, what we're doing end up doing is that we are we are actually playing to our own ignorance and calling it entertainment because we want to be stimulate stimulated year after year month after month year after year with these arguments these fussing matches that are being misnomered and called debates but we're not getting anywhere all right so we're gonna have to start doing this we're gonna have to start understanding the importance of proper research method the importance of uh, precise language objective language which is um, developing nomenclature for this particular subject or even the sub subjects that, that we discuss about. All right. So that's pretty much it. I, I wanted to share. And so, again, this is what or why it's very important to um, create nomenclature or what nomenclature is uh, from the get go. So with that being said, I guess um, between, I guess, June and Emicat, do y'all have any uh Thing to add or any comments 
or anything before I move on. Oh, uh, yeah, Dua, that was, um, that was really good. And, um, you know, I know you've spoken a lot um, on, on, on these issues, but I think it was good to pull them together in that manner because, um, as we've seen a lot, you know, that's exactly what, you know, you, you've el elaborated. Um, when people kind of just uh, misuse and abuse nomenclature and then, um, you know, um, you know, try to use them to, to, to discuss matters. And, and this is why we don't get any headway. We don't, we don't fix any problems. We don't even know how to identify the problems, uh, label them correctly, and then discuss them, you know, um, you know, in a more concrete manner where we're not all over the place. And I think, um, you know, that was good, just showing why that is necessary. And especially with the examples of the words that some of them, you know, we find to be polarized. Um, and people kind of just, um, you know, abuse them. You, you can see why, um, you know, those kind of issues arise. I, I think it was a good, um, it was an excellent <laughs> uh, presentation. And hopefully, yeah, it made sense um, to people as well who are watching. But that was excellent. All right, well, hopefully, um, yeah, and I can see the chat. So if you all are in the chat, let me make sure I refresh my screen. So I can see what is being said. So for those of you who are tuned in, if you have any comments about it, I'll tell you what, what, what I will do, because I want to keep this, this information that I just shared, I want to keep it, you know, digestible and bite-sized because we have a tendency if, if I open the panel and post a link, we'll run our mouths for, for a whole nother hour or so. And so instead of doing this on this video, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start another stream right now. So for 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 um, for you who are tuned in, we have like twenty four thousand people uh, tuned in right now. So I would hope like to hope that you all will uh, be patient and just come to the next stream because we're just going to have an open discussion. But I want to leave this um, this stream nice and 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 concise, you know, to the point, digestible. And everything like that. But uh, June, you have something you want to um, comment on real quick? No, that was that was good. That was real good. Um, you know, in many of these discussions, it's good to um, at first, you know, ask people um, how how are they defining these words? Because you know, like we talked about before, nomenclatures in certain fields have their their own meaning. Like in the court of law, <clears throat> a person can be a business and stuff like that. Or you often give the other example of, um, oh man, it, it just slipped my mind. Oh, oh, the a theory in the scientific field, a scientific theory is an explanation of facts, but everyday people talking, a theory seems to be more of a hunch. So, you know, when getting discussions, it's good to start off with uh, getting the nomenclature right um, to make these uh, discussions, you know, go better and um, more fulfilling. And like you said earlier, we can't be scared of these words. <clears throat> we can't be scared of these words and, um, you know, because uh, we have cases where, you um, I remember we had that that talk about the the comedic yoga poses mm -hmm. being uh you know we showed uh statues and the correct um you know the correct uh, position of the poses and how it was a uh, um basically a uh, aspect of art but we can't now say oh well since it's pseudo that we don't want to deal with it because the um, comedic yoga can be beneficial to you know your your life or your health, so we we can't be scared of these words and stuff. But uh, no, I appreciate the, the dialogue and just hope people take heed to it. Go to it. All right, I appreciate it. So, um, all right. So what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna I'm gonna post the link for those of you who you who want to come on the panel and talk about this topic hopefully that's what you want to talk about but you know we can we can um 
you know, kind of venture off into into any related topic. But I want to keep this video bite size. So we're at the 57 minute mark and that's really good if I keep it under an hour. So I'm going to post the link. You all can come on the panel and we're going to start another stream right after this. As soon as I close this out, we're going to start another stream. So just bounce right on over to the new stream and we'll be able to read your comments if you don't want to come on the panel. But let me get this link up uh, first real quick in this chat so that everyone will be able will have it and be able to join the join the panel. All right, so I'm posting it now. And again, I appreciate anybody tuned in. It's, I know it's late on a weekday, but hey, that's going that's that's like the new norm. Okay, so this is the link. Uh, actually, let me repost that again. Okay, so I posted a few times, so make sure you all jump on the link on the panel now, and we're going to shut this uh, stream down, and we're going to start another one right after. So you all can bounce over to that and uh, stay in the chat, participate in the chat. We're going to, um, you know, interact with anybody on the chat or come on the panel. We prefer you to come on the panel. Don't be scared, all right? We won't bite, but uh, come on on the uh, panel, and let's just have a conversation, all right? Like I said, you know, the topic is for, you know, importance of nomenclature, but if we venture off into a few things, that's, that's, you know, it's not a problem. All right. So with all of that good stuff, um, hope you all have some takeaways with what was shared and I'll see you all on the next stream, which will be starting right when this one finishes. When I say right after, I mean, right after. <laughs> all right. So I'm gonna say Shimon Hotep. <laughs>